Hello and welcome to the Gallagher Partnership Podcast. My name is John Neshes and I'm the Director of Partnership Marketing and Content Development here at Gallagher. I'm joined today by Jesse Agler, the lead play-by-play voice on radio for the San Diego Padres, now in his eighth year as a member of the broadcast team. So, you know, th- this next question is going to feel a little bit like uh, like a Bill Simmons type question from, from a few years ago. But, um, you know, in sports, if you're a fan uh, and you, you've been at it for a long time, I mean, I've been following my teams for, you know, 30, 40 years in some cases. And, and when you debate your either friends of yours or whatever it might be, you always think of, OK, who, who is on Mount Rushmore for my for my teams? If you had to, to go through and. and, and say who is on Mount Rushmore for the Padres organization throughout all the years from 1969 to today, who's on your Mount Rushmore? So I get four, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's, what that's we're it. With just here. four. Just four. So, I mean, two, two are really, really easy, uh, which are Tony Gwynn and Trevor Hoffman. You know, I think they, they, they kind of stand alone at, at this particular point. Um, you know, for, for number three, you can make an argument for Ray Kroc, who is the owner. Uh, that basically kept the Padres here. I think if Ray Kroc doesn't buy the team when he did, they are uh, not the San Diego Padres. They are the Washington, D.C. Nationals or whatever. Um, they were that close to moving to Washington. I think it was in the in the late 70s, mid-late 70s. They were so close, in fact, that there are actually baseball cards out there that you can find with Padre players wearing airbrushed Washington uniforms. Um, huh. for what they thought was going to be the first season in D.C. That's how close it came to the Padres leaving for Washington, D.C. in the in the late 70s. Um, and then Ray Kroc, uh, who's kind of the founder of McDonald's, everybody probably saw the movie yes. a couple of years ago, uh, he, he comes in and he basically buys the Padres. He wanted to buy the Cubs, couldn't. He's from Illinois, uh, ends up buying the Padres, investing in the Padres in a way that they had never seen before here. And uh, as we mentioned, they, they make it to that World Series in 1984. He passed before that season, but his wife, Joan, was the owner. She kind of uh, kept his vision going, and uh, that was a, a big moment. So I think because of that, you could uh, you could put Ray Kroc in there pretty comfortably. And then, you know, beyond that, Jerry Coleman, uh, who's, uh, you know, the second baseman for the Yankees uh, during one of their glory eras in the 50s and a World Series MVP, uh, came here as a broadcaster and, and did an awful lot of years and is really a beloved member of this. Uh, you know, Padre family passed away a few years ago, but a guy who's a Marine fighter pilot and this, of course, is a, is a big Navy town, a big military town. So he, he left Major League Baseball twice to enter active duty um, as a Marine fighter pilot in World War II and in Korea. He's the only guy to do that. Ted Williams left, but not for active duty both times. So that's a distinction that belongs solely uh, to, to Jerry Coleman. And again, there's a guy that was a World Series MVP and he was an announcer for the Yankees and then he came out here uh, to join the Padres. And, and he's just revered in, in a very significant way. So right now he, he's probably on there as well. But I tell you what, even though he's only played in 164 career games or whatever it is, Fernando Tatis Jr. is knocking on the door. Um, I mean, that's that's how significant he is. And the fact that he signed that contract, there probably are plenty of Padre fans who would put Fernando on Mount Rushmore even now, even though the fact that, you know, he's barely played what is the equivalent of one full season in the big leagues um, because he has committed himself to this organization essentially for the rest of his career. And, uh, and that means an awful lot to the people here. It really does. Uh, that's great stuff. That's great stuff, Jesse. And I've, I've got one more question. Um, and, and because of COVID, you know, we had, we haven't been able to travel like we wanted to. And I've never been to Petco Park. I can't wait to get to Petco Park. And one of the first places I'll be going when I get to Petco Park is Gallagher Square. Um, now, because of COVID, it hasn't gotten um, all of the use that, that it will be getting as, as things start to get better. But, but tell me about your thoughts on Gallagher Square as a community destination and how you feel it's going to add to the atmosphere in and around Petco. Well, l- let me start here. During games in normal times, it's a wonderful place. Uh, you know, I've got young kids, and, and that's where they go when they come to games because it's just open and easy, and they can walk around and be free. And it's a great place, particularly, I think, for young families to be able to take in a, a ball game. But I'll go beyond that. When, when I first got here to San Diego, it was the first thing I noticed about Petco Park is that you've got this area that is, yes, part of the ballpark, but also part of the neighborhood. And it's really unique and, and it's not artificial the way maybe, you know, other areas that have been built up around newer ballparks are. It's just kind of this natural extension, kind of connective tissue between Petco Park 
and the surrounding East Village neighborhood. And, and I say that as someone who lived in a building across the street for my, my first two years living here. My wife and I, we didn't have kids at the time. We lived downtown in a building that overlooked Gallagher Square, overlooked Petco Park. And you, you forget sometimes even walking through there on non-game days that it's sort of all part of the ballpark experience. It's that seamless. And, and as you said, it's, it's a great community uh, you know, meeting place, uh, whether there's a game going on or not. I think it's a unique space in all of baseball. It really is. And I think it is perhaps the thing more than anything else that makes Petco a part of downtown and not just this ballpark that sort of plopped onto a city block, but rather something that is just a, a seamlessly connected piece of the surrounding neighborhood. Oh, that's, that's a great description. And, um, I honestly can't wait to get there. Hopefully later this season, uh, I'll, I'll be taking the trip and then you and I can, can meet face to face and, and, and keep these conversations going. I love, uh, talking baseball with you, Jesse. I want to thank you so much for being part of the Gallagher Partnership podcast and we will catch up soon. John, my pleasure. Thank you for, uh, everything you guys all do here in San Diego and definitely look forward to having you out of the game soon.